next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12222 in the name of Patrick Harvey on young voters and school debates. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would also invite those members and indeed members of the public who are leaving the gallery to do so as quickly and quietly as possible. Please, I now call on Patrick Harvey to open the debate. Mr Harvey, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the chance to bring this motion for debate to the Chamber, and I'm grateful to those members who've uh, added their names in support. What I'm hoping to do uh, is have a, a debate where I'm sure members will recall, hopefully with excitement and, and, and passion, some of the experiences that we had during the referendum campaign and the positive atmosphere of engagement and inclusive debate that took place in schools. What I'm hoping we avoid is for people to say how great it was that their side won in their local school, because there are some arguments about the, the way that we engage with young voters in schools which should unite us all, whichever side of the referendum debate uh, individual members uh, or indeed campaigners in their local communities were on. There's some historic concern that I think all of us would share about low voter turnout among young people in particular. Now, that's not just a, a problem of the short term. It's a problem which compounds itself as each uh, young generation comes out with more and more young people who don't see voting as a normal thing to do. Uh, and that low voter turnout feeds through the generations uh, and becomes an ever more serious problem. I think it's important to recognise that not turning out to vote is not the same as apathy. A great many people, including young people who may not have been voting in elections for years, are still politically engaged and channel their political interests and energies in different directions. If they started turning out to vote but ended up losing their political interest in other areas, I wouldn't necessarily see that as progress. I want to encourage people to vote as well as being active politically engaged citizens in every aspect of their lives. But we do have an opportunity to turn around that problem of low voter turnout amongst young people by seeing the chance of voter participation, citizenship education, political engagement in schools, normalising the voting process. So that year after year after year, we're churning out from schools cohorts of young people for whom voting is a normal thing to do instead of a geek thing to do, because the, the problem has been that significant for a very long time. Now, if we can do that, we'll not only have uh, made sure that those young people see ways to get involved in politics, see a reason to get involved in politics and to have their views expressed in the political sphere, but we'll also hopefully turn around that dynamic and start to see turnout uh, across the board rise year after year after year as those young people uh, carry on voting because we know statistically not just in this country from around the world there's good evidence to show that if you vote the first time you're entitled to most people keep on voting most people keep on engaging with politics and if you don't vote the first time you're entitled to a great many people are well into their 30s or older before they start voting if ever at all so this is a, a long-term uh, dynamic that we need to turn around there was broad support, not unanimous support, but broad support for reducing the voting age to 16 for the referendum. There were also concerns that were raised, legitimate concerns, around how to ensure that that engagement could be done in a neutral and balanced way, how to avoid schools becoming uh, places where campaign activity took place at an inappropriate level, and what the boundaries were. Um, some of those concerns are legitimate concerns, even amongst those who supported reducing the voting age to 16. How well did we deal with those concerns? How well did we do this neutral, balanced, inclusive voter education and engagement within schools? Well, in many places, it was terrific. In many places, it was uh, everything that I would have wished it to be. And I took part in many debates, not just in Glasgow, but around the country, where young people were having the chance to give campaigners on both sides, politicians on both sides, a grilling, 
put difficult questions to us and engage themselves, tell us what they thought the priorities should be uh, and to, to have the chance to debate not just whether they were voting yes or no, but what kind of country they wanted to live in. And that sense that the first vote they were going to cast was on a defining question for their society. That was itself engaging. So in many places, it was terrific, but not everywhere. And I think we do need to recognise that it was a bit, a bit patchy. There were certainly uh, some local authorities which specifically didn't encourage schools to, to undertake those debates or set, set down rules about how they would take place, whether the, the two campaigns would be allowed to participate or not. The rules were different in different uh, local authorities. Some places left it entirely up to individual head teachers, and so the, the, the level of, uh, of, of participation and engagement that young people were exposed to would vary from school to school. And some had different rules about whether uh, campaign debates were permissible during the, the so-called purda period uh, or not. And so different rules were being applied in different ways in different parts of the country. There's a real opportunity that we have to learn from the best of what was done during the referendum campaign in preparation for the next election. Because there is now broad support for reducing the age of voting to 16 for elections as well. It will be more complicated to ensure political balance when you're looking at a multi-party election as opposed to a yes or no referendum. It will be more complex. There will still be concerns about how to ensure neutrality and balance, how to ensure inclusivity, how to deal with the reality that we're not just talking about citizenship education, but citizens who are already active participants in the political process. Concerns about how to deal with the fact that schools don't just have a cohort of pupils in front of them, they have a cohort of young voters, some of whom will be campaigners, some of whom will be activists, some of whom will be party members from one part of the political spectrum or another. That's something we should relish. That's something we should see as a positive opportunity, not just uh, as a problem. There will be concerns about these things those concerns should be addressed in a positive way rather than being used uh, as an excuse to close down debate or to close down the opportunities uh, that are in front of us. Deputy Presiding Officer, we, we do now have broad support for the principle that votes at 16 will be the norm for Scottish Parliament elections in the near future. My hope is that that happens for all elections throughout our society. Let's take the opportunity to use that to drive up voter turnout, to drive up political participation amongst young people, which will stay with them as they grow older. If we, if we learn from the best of what was achieved over, over the course of last year, then we'll, we'll manage that. If we end up seeing the situation remaining patchy, then we will have lost that, that really terrific opportunity. These things don't come around very often. The chance to really change the dynamic of our political process and make sure that young people see it as something that they have a right to engage in and a positive reason to engage in. So I do hope that members will agree that we can learn from the best of what was achieved last year during the referendum campaign. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. And now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. My hearty congratulations to Patrick Harvey for uh, giving us the opportunity to discuss this important subject. He, he, he said he wants a bit of excitement and passion, so let me just start with some. Um, I was a rather sickly young kid, so I read a lot of books because I was at home a lot of the time. And one of the early books I read, the first political book I read, was a biography of Lloyd George when I was about seven. And I found it fascinating because it had excitement and passion. Um, the passion was that his mistress was Frances Stevenson at age seven. I didn't quite understand what that meant, but it was certainly something to do with passion, and it was, uh, it was interesting. In those days, of course, the press were less interested in the private lives of politicians, and he conducted an affair with Frances Stevenson that extended over 45 years uh, and eventually married her uh, just before he died, after his wife had died. First election uh, I participated in was the 1961 East Fife by-election when Sir John Gilmer won the seat for the Tories. I was out campaigning for the Liberals and as a result, a few months later, joined the SNP in the Duncan Institute uh, in Cooper 
where 25 of us, 15, 16, 17-year-olds, uh, joined our first political party. So getting the youngsters engaged is not new. There's a bit of a cycle to it. Hopefully, however, we're in an upward cycle uh, that continues. Now, of course, getting involved in public life um, can happen at a very early age. Mary, Queen of Scots, was eight days old when she became queen, when James IV, her father, uh, died uh, after she was born in the Lithgow Palace. But uh, I think her engagement with politics was probably uh, pretty minimal. Now, the motion that's before us, a lot of interesting things, consensus for 16 and 17-year-olds, uh, the online uh, survey that's been done of young people shows that 8.5% are opposed to it, only 8.5%. So I think we can now say, without risk of much contradiction, that uh, giving our youngsters the vote is a pretty much general thing, a settled uh, will. Now, looking again at uh, the survey, uh, how to register, because this is the very first time we're registering people of this age, and there were some special issues around data protection and so on and so forth. 50% of people, according to that survey, got information at the schools. And I think the schools were a very important part of the campaign uh, in, in, in ensuring uh, that people uh, were informed. Now, there was variability in the engagement of schools. Uh, I think, uh, to some extent, the campaigns nationally um, had shortcomings on both sides of the argument. And by the way, in my constituency, I was, and during the campaign remained, and still am friends with those who espoused and campaigned for a different viewpoint. Politics at least can be conducted gentlemanly in Banff and Banffshire and Bucking Coast. I think both sides didn't realise the extent to which we would empower and activate grassroots. And in many places, we found that schools were trying to work with national bodies when the real energy of the campaign was in quite a plethora of small uh, local-based bodies. And schools found that difficult to engage with. The pattern of politics has changed, and the old methods were being applied. Schools played it safe. If they couldn't get someone from both sides of the argument, they, they were cancelling uh, debates. And I think that was uh, fairly uh, disappointing. Now, Sam Bailey, the Commissioner for Children and Young People, uh, particularly points to what the Scottish Youth Parliament did through its I, uh, nay, MIBI campaign. And I think it's important that young people themselves reach out uh, to other young people. And if we look at the survey, we find overwhelmingly that was the source of information for young people who voted. In other words, their own peer group. And I think that should be no surprise to us. Um, I, returning to Lloyd George, uh, my great hero as I approached my 70th birthday in 1908, Lloyd George, of course, introduced uh, the first national pension entitled as a matter of age, five shillings a week for 17-year-olds. Well done, Lloyd George. Well done, the Liberals, for encouraging me to get involved in politics. Their loss that I chose to join the SNP because of their manifest and obvious shortcomings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now call on Mark Griffin to be followed by Mary Scanlon. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate Patrick Carvey for securing the debate this afternoon um, on this important subject. I think the, it's fair to say that the referendum galvanised Scotland at home, at work, at community centres, pubs and of course in our schools, people in villages, towns and cities, whether they were yes, whether they were no, um, definitely had a view and that came over loud and clear and with a turnout of almost 85%, it was nothing that I've ever experienced and um, I don't think um, Scotland had experienced that level of turnout before and I don't think anywhere, um, nowhere else was the referendum more of a, a hot topic than in our schools with votes for 16 and 17 olds for the first time. Lots of school organised debates, some more freely than others with some of the rules that were um, spoke about by, by Patrick Harvey. I took part in a number of those school debates in Cumberland and Kilsyth um, and elsewhere in central Scotland. And I think anybody who participated in those debates would, would say that the, the general interest, the level of engagement from the, the young people who, they, who were there was incredible and like Patrick Harvey, I wouldn't be want to cheer 
one side's win over the other. What actually I think I would celebrate more than anything was the fact that the young people who were there were open to the arguments that were put, being put forward. Um, they were amenable to different points. In fact, I think quite a few of the, the votes that were taking place had shown that quite a few people had changed their minds over the course of the debate and were open to that information, probably a lot more own, open than anybody else in the chamber was to any arguments or information that we were getting. And I've been a, a supporter of votes at 16 for a long time, and I'm, I'm delighted that progress has finally been made. Um, I don't think it's right that 16 and 17 year olds um, can leave school, get a job, pay tax, uh, drive a car, but they don't have any say in electing any of us or their local representatives at a, a council level. Now, as someone who was brought up in a, a political family, I was involved in election campaigns from a, a very young age and I've been involved to some extent in every election in Scotland since 1992. And growing up, I was desperate to vote after handing out all those leaflets, um, being on battle buses, giving out balloons and, and everything else. And the only uh, wish that I had was that I would have gotten that chance earlier. Uh, like I said, I've been involved in every election since 1992. Um, but when I cast my vote, uh, my first vote, that was in 2004, um, 12 years on from first being engaged, and I'm sure some of you can do the maths on that one. Um, I'm pleased that um, we've committed in the Labour Party to extending the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds um, at a, a UK um, level to extend the, the franchise in the UK by one and a half million people, and I'm pleased as well that there seems to be um, a broad consensus here that we should do the scheme for uh, Scottish Parliament elections and, and council elections, I hope. Now, if we do put the referendum to one side, we do still have an issue with voter disengagement across the country, though. And there are lots of reasons for that, but we looked at the, the European election, which was a matter of months before the referendum, and only had a 33% turnout in, in North Lanarkshire. There was a similar turnout for the council elections in 2012. And so it's really important then that not only do we increase the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, but ensure that they get that balanced political education in school, that mock debates um, and elections are increased and become the norm so that there is that greater level of particular political engagement and understanding and um, as Patrick Harvey points out that they are motivated to vote in that first election and then that election becomes a, a pattern for the rest of the, the rest of their lives. I think um, finally, presiding officer, one thing that we should also be considering um, while extending the franchise is this new generation of 16 and 17 year olds who are allowed to vote and then when they go to cast the first vote in a uh, perhaps a cold and drafty community hall um, after years of um, taking part in online elections through Facebook, um, voting for an X Factor winner over the phone, that suddenly they're um, voting for a new you government a close, by please. post or in a, in a drafty community hall. And I think that's something that, that we should be looking at as well to increase turnout. And with that uh, point made, uh, I'll thank you, President Officer, for your patience and thank Patrick Harvey for bringing the debate to the Chamber. Many thanks. <coughs> now call on Mary Scanlon to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd also like to thank Patrick Harvey for securing this debate on young voters uh, and also welcoming the excellent work of the Devolution Committee. Uh, I think we all share the concerns regarding voter turnout, and I thought Patrick's analysis uh, uh, was excellent. Uh, having known Stuart Stevenson for a long time, can I just put on the record that I would like to thank our own Stuart for another one of his truly unique, excellent and memorable contributions to, uh, to this debate. Uh, I did my fair share of hustings across the Highlands, and I have to say that uh, uh, we almost started uh, sharing cars, myself and John Finney. I think I did more hustings with John than any other parliamentarian. Uh, but we didn't just meet 16- and 17-year-olds in schools. 
They also attended meetings in village halls. They joined in the street stalls. They were at the Highland Games, the agricultural shows, and the many other gatherings uh, to debate and to join in the referendum. We had a great team of young people in Murray, some of whom were still a few months too young to vote in the referendum. And they were certainly much more informed in the political debate than I ever was at their age. Uh, the Scottish Conservatives fully support the call for the franchise to be extended to include 16 and 17 year olds in all elections. And we were pleased that the Prime Minister's signature on the Edinburgh Agreement allowed 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the referendum last year. I noticed a, a, a Guardian article of the 7th of January uh, stating that the Prime Minister said he would be open to leaving it to MPs in the comments whether the vote should be extended to 16 and 17 year olds. I think the debate is interesting down south as well. And in the same article, uh, a number of Tory backbenchers, including former Minister Damien Green, Green, have expressed support for reducing the voting age. And I think that's very healthy, and I think we would all understand that's their decision, not our uh, decision. Uh, of course, the Smith Commission is now taking the next step in terms of lowering the voting age for 16, 17-year-olds in Scottish Parliament elections. It will be in place uh, for the 2016 uh, election uh, as we implement the first stage of the Smith Commission's historic cross-party agreement on devolution of further powers to Scotland, giving us all the powers in relation to Scottish Parliament and local government elections here. So whether you were for or against giving votes to 16 or 17-year-olds, no one could fail to be impressed at the participation and the understanding of the issues relating to the, the referendum. They made their own case. The questions from school pupils on the currency, EU membership, international crime, defence, terrorism, even MI5, could not fail to impress. 16, 17 year olds were not passive bystanders in this debate. They were at the heart of the debate. I attended hustings in schools from Tobermory to Gordonston with uh, Richard Lockhead. And at both Elgin High School and Gordonston, the attendance was around 300. I did notice a member of staff at Gordonston wearing a yes badge. So I can assume from that that they placed no restriction on freedom of expression or indeed freedom of speech. Unfortunately, we were barred by Highland Council from taking part in a debate at King UC High School and resorted to the village hall where some pupils were allowed to attend at the end of their school day. Unlike Scottish Borders Council, where schools were encouraged to hold debates during school hours, given the transport and travel issues in rural areas. It's also worth mentioning, presiding officer, that South Ayrshire Council provided a session for young people who had recently left school and were in the Skills Towards Employment project to improve their employability, uh, and they brought them into the debate too. Conservatives would not wish to dictate to local authorities how to conduct their approach to the referendum of national elections in schools. However, we would trust that all local authorities will reflect, as Patrick Hardy said, on what they did during the referendum, what worked, what didn't, and what they would do differently next time round. I think we have to respect the democratic status and responsibilities for councils. So finally, presiding officer, the mock election votes in Aberdeenshire and Murray uh, schools were both predicting a no majority at a time when the polls were emphatically yes. So it seems that the 16 and 17 year olds predicted the outcome much more accurately than many of the pollsters. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Hans Alan Malik. Uh, thank, thank you very much, President Officer. Can I congratulate Patrick Harvey for securing this debate, uh, obviously regarding the young voters, which I think we all are seeing is very, very important, not only to the young people involved, but to, to democracy as a whole. Indeed, Highland Secondary School, who were uh, in the gallery just shortly visiting the Parliament, and I think we're hoping to meet with them, them later, is a very good example of schools engaging with politics. Uh, local 
members, and Patrick Harvey will probably remember this, uh, can vouch for it uh, when myself and him and others uh, took part in mock elections. Uh, basically, the scrutiny and the questions uh, were very, very good indeed, I would, I would imagine we, we could say. They put so many different questions to us, uh, not just that particular school, but others as well. I think we all learned from that. Basically, I thought Alison was going to intervene there, sorry. I think we all learned uh, from that experience, not just in Highlands, but in all schools throughout the country as well. Uh, presiding officer, the, the referendum brought about uh, a huge interest in politics and in uh, participation, I think in a scale that none of us have ever seen before. And I do take on board what Patrick Harvey said. It was exciting, and it certainly was very exciting, not just for me, but for others as well. And I think it's really important to continue with that participation as the motion reads. And I do welcome the cross-party support uh, for voting for 16 and 17 year olds in the Scottish Parliament elections. And taking on board what Mary Scanlon has just said in regards to David Cam in Westminster, I certainly would encourage all parties at Westminster uh, to look to extending the voting age for that age to all parliamentary elections, as mentioned by Mark Griffins also. Now, as I said, Patrick uh, Harvey sorry, uh, spoke about the excitement and the vibrancy uh, during the referendum campaign, and he's absolutely correct. It was just uh, overwhelming. I, I just thought that everyone, young people and everyone involved, certainly in my area in, in Glasgow, became alive. It just became alive. People would ask you in the street. People would ask you in community centres. You went to visit various uh, school groups and, and groups who weren't actually in school, but various children's organisations. And that was all they could talk about because it meant something to them. And they were just so involved. It was absolutely wonderful. And I would just hope that we can continue that participation. And I must say that a number of the schools I visited since have continued that participation. Some of them have got Vox Pops, some of them have radio stations, they've got Facebook, they've got Twitter, all organised during the referendum campaign, but continued on from here. And of course, I think we've got to also men mention our education service here in the Parliament. I think they do a great job, not just in the outreach in the schools, but obviously bringing the kids in here as well, which obviously we would go and ask questions of and speak to as well. I think they do an excellent job. Stuart Stevenson mentioned uh, the Youth Parliament. They do a fantastic job as well. I, I was in Cardiff just recently with, uh, not recently, a couple of months ago with a representative from the Youth Parliament and we were talking to other areas, Isle of Man, Jersey, Guernsey, and they were so impressed what we were doing actually in the Scottish Parliament to engage and encourage young people to become involved. And it hasn't ended there, and I'm sure most of you will see this as well. We've got the general election campaign starting. The young people who were involved in the referendum campaign, particularly my area in Glasgow, they're back on the streets again. They're back in what we have in party. It's called the Party Hub, which was launched once again on Saturday. And these young people are back. And uh, a plug for Lady Gaga, but not the Lady Gaga, just uh, one of our uh, activists, as you might call it, <clears throat> who became involved and uh, comes along and sings, sings uh, to some of these uh, events that we have. So certainly it has transcended to the general election campaign as well. And I think we've got that, we've captured it, and we can't let it go. So I would just um, thank everyone, and thank Patrick in particular, for bringing forward this motion. And I really did enjoy all of the, the contributions today. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. I now call on Hans Alan Malik, after which we'll move to the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I also thank Patrick Harvey for securing today's debate. Um, it is an honor to talk about young voters and their engagement in today's debate. The 85% turnout in last September's referendum on Scotland's future was truly remarkable. However, a recent survey by TNS found that only 64% of people who voted in the referendum will or were planning to vote in the upcoming general election. More than 100,000 16 and 17 year olds came out to vote in the referendum, no doubt stimulated by the great, great important, importance of the question that were being asked about Scotland's future. But the fact remains that engaging young people in debate has proven to be quite difficult. As I have stated before, there is a wider problem of youth disengagement from politics. 
Putting the referendum aside, recent reports suggest that 30% of young people aged 18 to 25 were not even registered to vote in advance of the recent local and European elections. And there is also the people who are registered to vote but didn't actually bother voting at all. In the last general election in 2010, fewer than half of all 18 and 24-year-olds voted, which was much lower than the national average. Scotland has played an important role in supporting and encouraging debate on politics, and the issue is the run-up to the referendum. As past passions ran high, there were some instances where young people felt intimidated by both teachers and pupils of different options, opponents. Some of the most stimulating and thoughtful, thought-provoking experiences during the referendum campaign came from talking to young people up and down Scotland. On the whole, the referendum has been a positive experience for 16 and 17 year olds, which needs to be built upon. The Labour Party, like myself, strongly support the extension of the voting rights for, to, age, to this age group, and I am happy to seek, see a broad cross-party backing to support reducing the voting age to 16. So let's continue to build on that. But, Presiding Officer, I think what's remarkable and, and really very important is the fact that the Labour Party is wanting to s introduce this right across the UK, and I think that's important. 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds can get married, as already stated, hold jobs, be parents, and be successful and important elements of our communities. Why should they be denied the vote? It takes me back to the, the early days when women didn't have the vote, and it took a lot of campaigning for them to do that. I think voting is important. I think that young people should be encouraged, and I think that the new media system should be used as well, as a colleagues already mentioned. I think that online voting can be done and should be encouraged as well, because it means that many, many, very many people, people with disabilities, people who have difficulties in accessing buildings uh, and the like, can actually participate in voting themselves rather than have somebody else vote for them. I know that the postal system is there, postal votes are there. However, I think people want to actually see their vote to register online themselves. And I think if we can introduce that in the future as well, that would be very helpful. But uh, overall, I'm a great supporter of the, the age to be reduced and allowing our young citizens to participate as they do in everyday life. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we now move to closing speech to the Minister, uh, Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Um, seven minutes or thereby. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my congratulations to Patrick Harvey and thank him for bringing this debate to the Chamber in at, su at such a timely um, moment. Um, as many have already said, the referendum was a remarkable demonstration of democracy at its best. And it's right that the Chamber both recognises and celebrates the impact young people have had on politics and the opportunity that the extension of the franchise presents to our democracy. It's also right that we seek to maintain the momentum gained through the referendum and civic engagement, not only in young people, but right across the population in town hall meetings, public events and school debates. What the referendum and that phenomenal 84.5% turnout showed is that people are not indifferent to politics by nature. People engage and engage strongly when they see that they have a role to play and that they can impact and affect the outcomes. And that, that's perhaps one of the biggest roles for us as politicians is to show people that, that, that they do have a role to play um, at, at various revel, levels. Individuals across the country, many of whom had never voted before, and some of whom had not even registered to vote previously, engaged, sought out information and made their decision because they saw what could be achieved. They saw that their vote could make a difference which would impact on their lives. I, like many others, commend our schools, local authorities and other organisations who arranged, supported and participated in school debates, public hustings and information events, um, allowing young voters to engage with the issues and hear the arguments from both sides. Um, politician, 
political debates and mock referendum schools gave young people the chance to express their opinions on Scotland's future, and they did so in a mature and thoughtful manner. But I think I, I take on board the points made by a number of members across the chamber that, in some cases, that was uh, variable and that maybe we need in the future to be looking to how, how there can be a more consistent approach in that. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll steal Patrick Harvey's words here and say that you know, we really need to learn from the best um, as, as, we, as we take this forward. Um, but the curriculum for excellence gives all le learners the opportunity to gain the skills, knowledge and understanding needed to be politically literate. It helps learners to continue to develop as responsible citizens and to participate in decision making, to take an active role in society and to be directly involved in changing their communities for the better. So it's not just about voting, it can be other, other participation as, as well. Education Scotland's online resource for learners and educators covers not just the importance of political literacy and understanding politics, but also the role of social media and information about how young people can get involved in the democratic processes in their schools and communities. All parties, including the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and the Electoral Commission, have a shared aim to ensure that all young people are prepared to cast a well-informed vote after engaging in a balanced and well-informed consideration of the issues. Indeed. Patrick Harvey? I'm, I'm grateful. I wonder if he agrees with me uh, and would put it to the, the Directors of Education that part of that engagement all young people should be able to expect is active debates, which you don't have to be signed up to a modern studies class to, to go to, something that all young people get to participate in and experience in schools. Is that something that should become the norm everywhere? As I say, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and, and tell schools how to do their education, but I certainly think we, we should learn from the best. And in schools where there were those, those kind of debates, I think the young people uh, appreciated it and appreciated the, the, the fact that that gave them the ability to make um, the most informed decision possible. And I think somebody else had, had, had I think it was um, Mr Griffin, mentioned earlier that that age group were probably the, the group um, who changed their vote most often as they were, as they were hearing the arguments and, and, and deciding for themselves. Um, so the, the, the day of, of, pe of young people voting the way their parents voted um, for, for no other purpose, I think they're gone and, and young people have shown that they are going to make up their own minds and their own decisions based on the facts as they see them. Um, Many people across the chamber and, and um, up and down the country have examples from our own constituencies where young people have been given the opportunity to engage, to learn and to make mature, thoughtful and responsible decisions. And on every, every opportunity, they have grasped that opportunity willingly and with ability. Presenting officer, Scotland's young people have amply demonstrated their enthusiasm, engagement and willingness to participate in the democratic process. They have not taken that responsibility lightly and neither should we. A lot has been said about the record-breaking turnout and unprecedented levels of engagement by the people of Scotland. Scotland should be proud of the fact that we are now the most democratically engaged nation in Western Europe, and we must not lose the momentum that was reflected in the substantial number of people who voted for the first time, including 16- and 17-year-olds. And the Scottish Government is committed to playing its part in meeting that ambition. Our programme for government, published in November, set out uh, our commitment to learn lessons from the referendum, as Patrick Harvey had said, and to continue the process of making, vo making voting more meaningful for our people and our communities. In particular, I want to ensure that young people have the opportunity to meaningfully engage with and shape democratic debate as they did ahead of the referendum. Um, it has long been the Scottish Government's policy to extend the vote to 16- and 17-year-olds, where we can do so. Um, we did so for the referendum because it was the right thing to do to encourage participation of young people in Scotland's democratic processes and to give them a voice on matters that affect them. We have had success on that front, and I am delighted that there is now cross-party support in the Scottish Parliament for extending the franchise to include 16- and 17-year-olds for the Scottish Parliament and local government elections. And I'm delighted that we now have a deal with the UK Government to transfer the required powers to make this possible. The Government now intends to bring forward legislation to the Scottish Parliament as soon as possible after the order is in force to lower the voting age to 16 for these elections. And that will allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in the 2016 and all future Scottish Parliament and local government elections. Now, during, during the debate on the 23rd of September, the, the then First Minister called on all parties to take a vow to urge the UK Government to build on the success of the referendum and to lower the voting age to 16 for all elections. Indeed, many young people who participated in the referendum in September 
will be somewhat disappointed that they cannot participate in the, the Westminster elections that will take place in May. That frustration that Mark Griffin felt um, when he was, I think, 12. Um, who deny that the decisions to extend the referendum franchise to 16 and 17-year-olds and its implementation was an outstanding success and a contribution to the unprecedented levels of democratic engagement that we witnessed. The case for extending the franchise to 16 and 17-year-olds in all elections is no longer theoretical. It is now unarguable. But unfortunately, the powers in relation to the franchise for UK elections and the EU elections remains with Westminster. The Scottish Government, and I hope everyone in this chamber, um, will urge the UK Government to bring forward um, legislation at Westminster as soon as possible to lower the voting age for its elections also. Um, but for now, can I again thank Patrick Harvey for bringing this debate to the Chamber and urge everyone across the Chamber um, to work with the Scottish Government to ensure a swift passage of the legislation to enfranchise 16 and 17 year olds in good time for the Scottish Parliament elections on the 5th of May 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2 o'clock. <laughs>